Hello and welcome to GameSack. Hacks and homebrews have been part of the gaming scene since pretty much almost forever. Mostly on the PC side of things since the large majority of people did not have the ability to alter or create code for home consoles. That is until emulators and flash cartridges started becoming commonplace. Hacks are always fun because people will often take an existing game and improve it, sometimes greatly, or even take a game and modify it so much that it seems like it's a brand new game. This first hack is called Star Fox 64 Survival and it's from Casper, Zell, and Kaze, or maybe Kaze. It's on the Nintendo 64, naturally. Now, you might think this is a hack for Star Fox 64, but you'd be so incredibly wrong that it would be sad to even associate with you. It's actually a hack for The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. You play as Star Fox, but of course you have Link's N64 moveset. Basically, you're in a small-ish area with a bunch of enemies. The enemies are all located on your map in the lower right corner. And guess what? You need to defeat all of the enemies using every power available to you. Once you do this, a door will open and a treasure chest will appear with an item. Once you get the item, you can then go into another room. In here, there are creatures whom you can talk to and buy things from. When you're ready, sleep by the fire and suddenly it's the next day. Each day, you do the same thing, but the enemies you fight are randomized. Can you survive until the 31st day when this boulder moves out of the way? Fortunately, you can save your progress so you don't have to do all 31 days in one sitting. The biggest issue for me is that the action doesn't control as well as I'd like, mainly because it's unchanged from the original game. I mean, I want a jump button, damn it! I don't feel like I'm truly in control of the character. Also, when your hearts are low, you get that obnoxious audible warning that will not stop until you raise them again. When this happens, I usually just commit suicide and restart. It is seriously worth it for me. I wish they could have just hacked that nonsense out. Otherwise, the visuals are pretty good for the console, though after a short time, there's really not much else to see. The new music, though, is very high quality, and it sounds great. In the end, I only lasted until day three until the repetition just wore me out. Once again, you can just save it and do a couple of days here and there until you get to the last day. And for that reason, I recommend giving this one a go. Here's Street Fighter Special Champion Edition on the Genesis. This has a number of hacks applied, a couple of which I've talked about before. First, the colors have been enhanced by Pyron. Next, the voice samples have been improved by Steph. But this hack also adds CD quality music from the 3DO Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo game. This MD Plus hack was done by Pepilo PEV or Pepio PEV, and the music porting was handled by Relic. This works on the Mega SD as well as the Mega EverDrive Pro flash carts. Just make sure you have the latest firmware and also that the ROM name and the cue sheet name are the same. I'm not sure if any emulators support this as that's not really my area of expertise, but I don't see why they couldn't be made to. Anyway, I've always felt that the 3DO game had some of the best arrangements of the traditional Street Fighter 2 music out there, and it's great having them here. Not only that, but it has the danger music like the Championship Edition Arcade, where if one fighter's life bar gets too low, the music changes to become more intense and warn you that someone is nearing death. Wait a minute, people don't die in Street Fighter games. The colors, of course, bring the game closer to the arcade, and the voices and other sounds won't make your ears want to kill themselves. This is a great way to play the game. Not to be outdone, Super Street Fighter 2 on the Super Nintendo has its own 3DO music upgrade courtesy of the MSU-1, which is compatible with the FX Pack Pro flash car and some emulators. As far as I can tell, this hack was done by Khan, and it also makes some attempt to correct the colors to be more arcade-like. The music was once again prepared by Relic. This is a definite upgrade over the standard cartridge version as the music no longer stops between rounds. And obviously the music itself is hugely improved. 
Unfortunately, there's no danger music in this particular hack. Still, this is a welcome hack indeed. Back on the Genesis, we have a patch from Infinest for Super Street Fighter 2. This, once again, also adds the 3DO music. Actually, you can use the arcade music or whatever instead. There are a few different packs you can download. This one also has improved voices by Steph and background updates by Max Ferris. This game has always been extremely quiet for some reason, so the music here had to have its volume lowered as well. You'll really need to turn up your volume dial to enjoy this one, but hey, at least the danger music is here. Fixing the music and voices upgrade the very worst aspects of this port. And now, this might just be the best way to play Street Fighter 2 on a 16-bit console. What do you think? Alright, I'm not done with the hacks yet. I mean, there are literally thousands of them I could show you, but I'm just picking the ones that interest me, I guess. Anyway, let's get back to the hacks. Doom on the 32X is known for coming up a little short. It tried, but in reality it was a rushed project and they couldn't make it everything they wanted it to be by the shipping deadline. The visuals are restricted to a small window and they're quite grainy. The music is fartastic as well. Plus, there are some missing levels. Well, this hack called 32X Resurrection from D32XR team shows you what could have and frankly what should have been. Almost everyone just seems to refer to this hack as Doom Resurrection. This features an all new engine written specifically for this hack that improves a great many things. For one, the graphics are way, way better. The action doesn't take place surrounded by a border. There's more detail and it's far easier to make out what things in the distance are and generally just easier to see all around. The visual fidelity was improved thanks to a nice high color mode which you can toggle off in the options if you want. There's even an anamorphic widescreen mode, though it achieves this by stretching the playfield vertically. You don't actually get a wider view. Still, it's pretty cool to be playing another anamorphic widescreen game on the 32X other than Virtua Fighter. The sounds have been improved as well. Not only do the sounds, well, sound better, but there's also stereo panning so you can hear the direction a monster is relative to your out for blood self. Even the music has been drastically improved and it sounds great. You can even select CD mode if you have a special CD that you burned in your Sega CD to listen to the music that way. And yes, the levels that were missing in the original are here. You also get split screen multiplayer and even a LAN multiplayer using the zero tolerance link cable. You can adjust the resolution and level of detail just like a computer game. Lower these if the 32X you're playing on is less powerful than other 32Xs, like if it has an inferior graphics chip or a slower CPU compared to other 32Xs. I mean, that's why these settings are here, right? I'm just kidding. Putting everything to its lowest settings does make it run a hair smoother, but it never reaches 60 frames per second or anything. The difference in frame rate is hardly night and day, so I'm happy with running everything at its maximum settings. Overall, this is a monumental hack and they really went all out. They addressed just about everything that could be addressed, given the limitations of the 32X. I think the 32X as a product would probably have still failed pretty badly had Doom been this awesome from the beginning. But perhaps that failure would have stung a little less for the people who had bought it.
Race Drive-In on the Super NES from THQ is a curious release. I mean, look at this. The Super NES isn't known for its 3D polygon pushing abilities as its CPU maxes out at 3.58 MHz and it often runs slower than that. This game runs at an average of about 4 or 5 frames per second. That's right, you can count the frames on one hand, assuming your hand is fairly normal. And yeah, this was an actual retail release that people paid money for. But we were stupid in the 90s, not smart like everyone here watching GameSack, so we loved it. Actually, we didn't, but I had an odd appreciation for games like this back then. A year or so ago, Vitor Valella decided to give this game the SA-1 treatment. By the way, apologies if I mispronounced that name, but hey, I'm American, it's practically my duty to mispronounce things. The SA-1 is an add-on chip that helped with games like Super Mario RPG. This chip runs at over 10 MHz, and the hack for race driving shifts much of the processing over to the SA-1. You can play this on real hardware using the FX Pack Pro or on a few different emulators. Anyway, this results in almost a 1000% increase in the game's frame rate. That means it's 10 times better for you non-mathematicians out there. Not a thousand times better. Anyway, it's actually playable now. It runs at an average of 30 frames per second most of the time. Actually, that's not 10 times or 1000% faster. My math sucks. But it feels like 10 times or 1000% better. It makes the game easier since you can get a feel of the momentum and the controls respond more quickly. Of course, the game logic wasn't originally programmed to process things at this frame rate, so he had to make a lot of changes to the game logic as well. Sometimes the graphics will break up here and there, but again, it wasn't originally made to do this. I feel maybe the countdown clock could be made a little faster to increase the challenge as now it might be a bit too easy. This is still really fun, and I love projects like this. Incredible. Vitor also did an SA-1 hack for Super R-Type. If you spent any time at all with this one, you'll surely remember how this game really chugs in some spots. In a lot of spots, actually. In fact, it helped make the game easier because your reaction time didn't need to be as fast. But with the SA-1 hack, all of that slowdown is gone as the SA-1 is processing most of the game now. And yes, as a result, you really need to be on your toes as even in the first stage bullets will fly at you with incredible speed. Well, at least a lot faster than you were expecting if you were used to the original game. Unfortunately, he couldn't work around the bug that exists in the SNES hardware when it comes to flicker. When too many sprites are on one horizontal line, the hardware wants to erase the highest priority sprite instead of the lowest, meaning your ship, even if it wasn't on the overloaded scan line. The only way around this was for the software to cycle through all of the on-screen sprites instead of just that line, so you get stuff like this. They supposedly fixed the hardware after the first batch or two of consoles came out, but games still had to work around this issue. So don't blame the hack when you see this issue happen. How far can you get in this game without the slowdown? If you've been watching GameSack for a while, you know I love quality digitized voices in old games. Well, Maxim has added arcade voices into a few Sega Master System games like Alex Kidd The Lost Stars here. The original two voices in this game sound like this. Find the miracle ball. But the arcade voices added into the game sound like this. Find the miracle ball. That's definitely better, but how about Space Harrier? The game originally only had the scream and the get ready after he gets back up from falling. Maxim added the arcade versions of those two voices and also the one at the beginning of the game when it starts. Welcome to the fantasy zone. Get ready. Wow, I swear that has got to be the most realistic sounding voice ever played back on a Master System console. Welcome to the fantasy zone. Get ready. Seriously, I would have crapped my pants back in 87 if I knew the console could sound this good. There's no voice telling you that you're doing great between stages, sadly. Here's what all of the original voices sound like. Get ready. 
And here's what the hack sounds like. Get ready. Welcome to the Fantasy Zone. Get ready. Lastly, he put all of the arcade voices into the version of Altered Beast that's on the console. Power up. I never would have thought that this game could potentially have better voices than the Genesis version, but hey, here it is. Here are all of the original voices from the retail release of the game. And here are the arcade voices coming from the hacked game running on my master system. Power up. Welcome to your doom. <laughs> Never give up. Thank you so much, Maxim, for doing these. More, please! Alright, let's move on to homebrews. And the definition of a homebrew that I'm using for this episode is basically software that's created from the ground up for a console that's being given away for free. Yes, technically games like Paprium or Xenocrisis are homebrews, but those are being sold. So I'd rather put stuff like that in a new games for old consoles episode. Anyway, a homebrew can be something completely original. It could be a port of a game from one console to another console. Hell, honestly, it doesn't even have to be a game. This first homebrew is something that's not a game, but really deserves to be covered anyway. This is called the 240p test suite, and this version is for the 32x. It's originally from Artemio, but he had help from these fine folks for this port. There are versions available for the Genesis, Super NES, GameCube, PC Engine, and quite a few other platforms. This little tool has lots and lots of test screens to make sure your displays or upscalers are set up the best way they can be for that particular game console. That's why there are so many versions of this homebrew. You can check to see if the entire image fits on your screen, check for color bleed from your monitor, look for sharpening halos, and lots and lots of other stuff. You can even see how much your modern display blurs the scrolling as compared to a CRT. In the case of the monitor I use to capture these games, it's quite a bit. Fortunately, I tend to look at the CRT as I'm actually playing. Update, about a week after I shot that segment, I ended up getting a BenQ monitor. As you can see, the scrolling is significantly less blurry. What a funny name for a company, Ben Q. Hey guys, what should we name our company? I know, I know, let's call it Ben Q. Yeah, we can say it stands for bringing enjoyment and quality. Ben Q, yeah, that sounds awesome. Everyone will want to buy our stuff with a name like Ben Q. Ben Q, yay! Here, I'm dialing in the H sampling on the Retro Tink 5X upscaler so I can get the best possible image from the 32X. Unfortunately, the 32X and the Genesis are slightly off from each other when it comes to age sampling, so you can see a discrepancy in games that have both a 32X layer and a Genesis layer. So if you're using a RetroTINK, I recommend just using the generic 4x3 mode. There are also lag tests to perform, audio sync tests to see if your equipment is delaying the audio or video, and things like that. So this isn't a piece of software that you're going to be able to speedrun, get a high score on, or hell, you can't even 1cc it. But it certainly can help you get the most from the equipment that your consoles are hooked up to. This one's called Silent Hill Genesis. It's for the Genesis. An individual going by the name of Lupus ported the Silent Hill play novel from the Game Boy Advance to the Genesis back in 2013. That's right, this is a visual novel, or text adventure if you're not familiar with the term visual novel. Except that there's not much adventure here. There's no music either, so how about I put some Silent Hill music from the PlayStation on in the background while I talk about this. Ah, much better. I do greatly enjoy the horribly written narrative text provided. Her eyes closed. Cheryl sleeps peacefully in the passenger seat. Cheryl is my daughter. Cheryl is sleeping. A child should not be awake at this hour. I wonder if she is dreaming about something. Although paved, this is still very much a mountain road. At this hour, there is little reason for any other drivers to be about. I push in the accelerator. There is no light off in the darkness. I can depend only on my headlights. Light reflects off of the rear view mirror. It's a motorcycle. There is a motorcycle headed toward the same destination as we are at terrific speed at this late hour. 
With a roar, the motorcycle effortlessly passes by the side of my Jeep. You don't do much but read and advance the text. Every once in a while there will be a choice that you can make, but it doesn't seem to have much if any effect on the final outcome of the events. With all of this reading, I kinda do wish they had picked a nicer font. There are sometimes simple puzzles to solve as well, which helps break up the monotony. Something enters my field of view. It's the motorcycle from just before. It is lying on its side on the shoulder of the road. No doubt about it, it's the same motorcycle that just passed me. There is no sign of the driver. It looks like the driver smashed into the surface of the rocks by the side of the road while trying to avoid some kind of obstacle. And thus, that part of the motorcycle has been destroyed. The visuals are pretty grainy, which is hardly surprising considering the console's color limitations. There's no animation. There is actually some sound though. Occasionally, you'll get a short digitized sound effect relevant to the scene. I was surprised that they put any sound in here. Overall, this is much shorter than the real Silent Hill game, of course, and there's not much in the way of interactivity. But I was still amused, at least for a short while. Inside the clock tower, a physiologically loathsome stench hung in the air. However, the smile of my beloved daughter in my heart lessens my uneasiness and lets me forget my fear, if even only for a moment. Reassured, I place my foot on the ladder leading underground with my greatest motive called love. This one is called Dangan GB from Snorpung and Nordluf, and it's for the Game Boy. This is a simple shooter where you fight bosses, and well, that's basically it. Nothing complex going on here, however, it's a bullet hell style shooter. You don't see a lot of those on the Game Boy. You need to avoid all of the shots represented by the dots moving on screen. Your hitbox is only a single pixel big. If you're playing on normal or easy, you have a limited number of bombs that will immediately clear the screen of all shots. There's no way to earn more bombs, so use them wisely. The bosses take about a billion shots to die. Eventually, they will go down, though. Once they do, you'll get some bonus points and maybe an extra life, and then it's on to the next boss. To get an extra life, you need to have decent shot accuracy and get a good score. Good luck on the accuracy part. The game is mostly about focusing on your ship, making sure it doesn't touch any of the moving pixels while you fire away hoping some of your shots hit the boss. That doesn't do good things for your accuracy. The closer you are to the enemy as you hit them, the more score you'll get, but that doesn't seem to deal any more damage. And of course, there are no life bars in sight. This game is good for bullet hell fans, I guess. For me, it was fun for about 10 minutes. I really like the music, but I just need more in my shooter. There's also Bullet GBA for the Game Boy Advance from these fine people. Similar bullet hell concept here, emphasis on the hell part. You're just an at sign and everything looks very simple. Break through the barriers of the thing shooting at you and then destroy it. You may think that you could hold your Game Boy Advance sideways and play it like this, but no. The controls don't work that way and there are no options to change them that I can find. So the game needs to be played like this. Aside from the impressive speed on display here, Dangan GB just plows right over this one. Last up is a sneak peek at Mega Final Fight on the Mega Drive slash Genesis. This is a new port of the arcade game from CFX, which consists of Edmo Caldas, Master Linkui, and Maro Xavier. This isn't finished yet, so not everything in here is final, but man, this is looking fantastic so far. My version of this ROM has this screen on it, so that makes it easy to track if I leak it. Before, you could only play Final Fight on the Sega CD, or if you were really a glutton for punishment, the Super Nintendo. This one runs completely on the Genesis without the need for a Sega CD or anything like that. Yes, two player simultaneous are supported. The Sega CD version was and always will be a fantastic conversion. But Mega Final Fight attempts to be more faithful to the arcade. The characters are about the same size between this and the CD version, but they've been refined a bit. It also puts a lot more enemies on screen, even than the CD version's Mania mode. 
As a result, there's some slowdown and flicker that's inevitable, and I doubt they'll be able to fix it, but I'd rather have that than fewer enemies and a lack of two players. The weapon swinging animation is much better than Final Fight CD. In that version, the weapon animation would lag behind the player animation by a frame. But here in Mega Final Fight, well, it's as it should be. In addition to the arcade mode, which has all the features you see here, there's also the new Mega mode, which really makes this project stand out. You now have additional story aspects to the game. In addition to that, you also have new moves for each character. This is cool and makes me want to attack enemies with my new flaming uppercut. Yeah, you didn't see that coming, did you? Not only that, but you get new characters like Maki here. If you've only played Sega in your life, then you don't know who this is. She's from Final Fight 2, which was exclusive to the Super NES. She's a really fun and quick character, but be careful because she doesn't have the strongest defense. She's not the only addition, though. Oh, Captain, my Captain. In addition to all that, you'll get survival mode, boss rush mode, and a time attack. I love how they have the traffic moving down below. Over here on the Sega CD version, the cars appear abandoned because they never move. I don't know, maybe they're fighting over the last bits of food in a post-apocalyptic world. But here in Mega Final Fight, the world is still alive and functioning, so that makes me feel pretty good, and it should make you feel pretty good too. There are also other new things that aren't quite ready to show yet. The music is being handled with care as well, with lots of new tunes in the Mega Mode. There's still a lot of work to be done, so some things that you see here might change, but you're going to want to download this one the instant it's released for the public. I don't know when it's coming, but I'm guessing early 2023. In fact, I'll probably cover the finished version of this one in the future. And there you go, a bunch of different hacks and homebrews. It's always interesting to see what the community comes up with. And if I didn't cover your particular hack or homebrew, I am so sorry, but it's easy to get overwhelmed with everything that's out there. So let me and everyone else know down in the comments the hacks and homebrews that people should try out. I'd be interested to hear it. And don't forget to subscribe. Wait, why did I say that? Oh well, keep watching after the credits. Anyway, thank you for watching GameSag. Hey guys, welcome back to a new video. Make sure you click that like button and subscribe to the channel. Have you ever wanted to play some games on your PlayStation 4, but no matter what you do, it just doesn't seem to turn on? I get that a lot too. Guys, if you like the content, please smash that like button. It really helps me out. Also, be sure to subscribe while you're at it to get free new videos every 15 minutes. And don't forget to click that bell so you get notified when I upload new videos like this one. And while you're down there, don't forget to leave a comment so I know what you're up to. Anyway, your PlayStation 4 is not dead. That I promise you. I'll show you exactly what to do to get it up and running like new in this very video. So you're trying to turn on your PlayStation 4, but everything is so crazy and messy, just like the hairs around your balls. Today's sponsor is Manscaped. Trim your bush with Manscaped cube trimmers. So your PlayStation 4 seems dead, but it is definitely not. Guys, I will show you how to fix this in five easy steps. Step one is to make sure you're subscribed. Now this will not work unless you are subscribed, so make sure you are subscribed. Step two is to like this video. Now it may work if you skip this step, but it won't work as well. So I recommend you like this video right now. Step three is to share this video with everyone you know. Guys, this is essential. Okay, now before we move on, let's review steps one through three. Step one, subscribe. Step two, like this video. Step three, share this video with everyone you've ever had an interaction with during your time on God's green earth. Okay guys, now we're really gonna get into it. This is step four. You may have noticed the strange wire sticking out of the back of your PlayStation 4, and this is the key to get your PS4 working like new again. So go ahead and grab this wire, don't worry. 
worry, it's safe. Okay, I just wanna pause right here for a sec to remind everyone to like this video and please subscribe to the channel. Guys, I work so hard making these videos for you and it's not very hard to like this video and subscribe. It really helps out a ton. Oh, and if you guys could please go back to yesterday's video and give that one a like too, oh, that would be so fantastic. Also, leave a comment and let me know what you thought of that video. I love you guys, you're the best. Now for step five, you wanna take this power cord and insert it to what's called a power receptacle. Just plug it right on in there. Now, these can be anywhere in your house, but you wanna plug it into one that's close to your PlayStation 4. And there you go, now your PlayStation 4 turns on. All right, guys, we did it. So let's review again. Step one, subscribe to this channel. Guys, if I can get to 600,000 subscribers, I will make a video of me dancing in public, which I do not want to do. I do not want to do it, but a promise is a promise. I don't wanna do it. Please, please, please subscribe. Step two, like this video. Guys, if I can get 15,000 likes, I'll make a video just like this one, but for the Nintendo Switch, wow. Step three, share this video everywhere. Step four, grab the wire. Step five, plug in the wire. And now because you guys are the best and I love you, I'm gonna cover another issue that a lot of people run into for free. But you're certainly not gonna run into any issues with today's sponsor, NordVPN. It works great when you play League of Legends. So, okay, you've got your PlayStation 4 turned on, yet still nothing is on screen. What's going on with that? Well, I'm gonna tell you guys right here in this very video, here's how to fix it. Step one, subscribe to this channel. Guys, I cannot stress this enough. You really do need to be subscribed. Step two, like this video and also go back to episode 277 and give that one a like. It really helps out. I mean, it really helps out a lot. It helps out a ton. It so much helps out. Step three, leave a comment on episode 277 and let me know what you thought of that video. Oh man, I cannot wait to read your guys' comments and I read every single one of them. Step four, share this video with your family and friends. Step five, share episode 277 with your family, friends, and coworkers. Step six, make sure your family, friends, coworkers, and enemies all subscribe to my channel. Step seven, make sure your family, friends, coworkers, and enemies all like episode episode 277 as well as this video. Step eight, get your family, friends, coworkers, and enemies to drop a comment in the comment section below. Guys, I love hearing from you. Oh man, it's awesome. Step eight and a half, shave your balls with Manscaped pube trimmers while playing League of Legends as you're being protected by NordVPN. Step nine, your TV may have come with a weird wand like this and it usually has a little red button that will turn it on. This lets the TV know that you're ready to use it, otherwise it has no idea what's going on in the world. Step 10, enjoy your PlayStation 4, guys. Woohoo, we did it. There you go. I really hope this helped out everyone watching this, and I hope I made your day brighter. Guys, if this video helped you out, be sure to smash that like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell so that you get notifications, and drop a comment below so I know I helped you out. Also, be sure to click on one, if not all of the things that I've plastered on the screen. They don't get in the way of anything, and they're not tacky at all. You guys are the best. I love each and every one of you.